Well, hey, thank you for joining us today. My name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here at the Father's House Church. And today we're going to be continuing in our series, Jesus Every Day. But first, we want to acknowledge that there's a couple of ways we gather here at the Father's House Church. The first is, like you may be doing right now, is online. The second is in our house churches. And the third is in the Father's Backyard, right here in the building at 9 11 a.m. We want to see you here. If that's one of the ways you would like to gather with us, we'd love to see you at any of those ways. Uh, but what we have going on here in, a, in the life of our church is some really cool things. We want to get you connected into those things. So if you haven't already, you may be one of the first people to do it. Text CONNECT to the, our number 760-334-5533. What this is going to do is just get a little bit of information about you. We want to get to know you and we can find a great fit for where you can fit into the community here at the Father's House Church. But that being said, we have something really exciting coming up. The first Sunday of every month, we're going to be having Sunday Fun Day. And what this is going to be is actually a time where we're just going to intentionally connect through doing community together. What that means is having fun. So we have, we've had a couple of games in the past. There may be one coming up on March 7th, but we would love to see you here March 7th for Sunday Fun Day at the Father's House Church, 9, 11 a.m. And as well as uh, those exciting things happening, we're also going to continue in thanking you guys for the generous giving that's been happening and is continuing to happen. We really believe that God is advancing His kingdom through what we're doing here as a community at the Father's House Church. But that being said, we're going to pray together over the, the tithes and offerings. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity you've given us to give and bless people. Father, we pray that you would bless the gift and the giver, God, and that you encourage us to continue to give generously, God, because you have so blessed us, Father. We love you in your name. Amen. Before we go into a time of worship, I just want to remind you a couple of ways to give. First, we have through our app, as well as through our website and here in person. We also collect tithes and offerings. If you uh, have any questions, please go ahead and uh, send us in the comments. We'd love to get you plugged in. But that being said, we're actually going to continue in worship with actual worship. So please join us together. You know, every time I sing this song, I'm brought back to that moment kid. I couldn't sleep and my parents would come in and sing this over me. It's straight out of scripture. It's from the Jesus movement. Not too far from here in San Diego, God reached an entire generation, including my parents, through songs like these. So I just want to encourage you to sing this song over any place where you're anxious, any place where you're afraid, any place where you're worried.
I don't know about you, but I really, really love that song. It's kind of personal to me. My parents used to sing it. It comes out of the Jesus movement. They used to sing it to me as a kid. And a lot of times when I'm in anxious situations, I'll find myself just singing through that simple chorus. So I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you enjoy this quick study as we continue our study of Jesus every day, what that looks like out of Galatians chapter 5. If you missed any of the past messages, you can find them all on the Father's House YouTube channel. And of course, the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what Jesus looks like every day when we are living in Him and He is living through us. And I don't know about you, but I think we're living in a day and age right now when we all could use a whole lot more of this right here. Peace. Everything uh, is just slowly starting to open up again. And so there's a, you know, a bit of relief. There's a, you know, maybe a light at the end of the tunnel. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to kind of getting back to traveling and vacation. And I remember it was a couple years ago that God really gave me a solid lesson on peace. And I, I kind of misunderstood it. And it was during a vacation. You see, when, we, when you live in Hawaii, you travel to the mainland. When you live on the mainland, you travel to Hawaii. And so we'd been on the island for a few years and we really missed our family. And so we got all five of our boys and we were super, super excited about going to see our family and doing a road trip across three states. Now, already you're kind of going, John, is is that peaceful? No, it, it wasn't at all. Three states, five boys, one car. Yeah. Anyways, I realized quite quickly that peace isn't automatic. You have to pursue peace. And I, I, I know that the truth is that if we don't have the fruit of peace at home, we're certainly not going to have it on the road. And I got really tested in that reality as we went forward. I remember when we were at the, the TSA here, you know, and everyone's still smiling because we haven't gone through the TSA uh you know, pat down yet. And, and that was an experience in and of itself. We, we got all the boys through, right? This is a few years ago. And I remember they stopped us and they said, excuse me, uh, you guys can't move any, any farther. Uh, we have detected bomb residue in one of your bags. <laughs> and, and I'm, and Cindy's pointing at me and I'm like, bomb residue. What are you talking about? They held up my snack bag, right? They don't, they don't feed you on the plane. There was no way I was going to pay that much money for the snack. So I had packed it full of bagel sandwiches and cold Costco pizza. And I'm like, there's only food in there. I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, well, I'm sorry. It's scanned as bomb residue. So we're going to need to pat one of you down. And of course, Cindy was kind enough to oblige me. So this guy sidles up next to me and like, I'm serious, he whispers in my ear, if you would feel more comfortable, I can take you to a side room and examine your body. And I'm like, what in the, what, what are you talking about? And I'm like, no, we're gonna stay right here. My wife's right there, we're all right here. Whatever you gotta do, do it right now. And let's just say if I had had any peace on the front end of that TSA check-in line, um, I didn't have any peace afterwards because that guy was thorough. I. <laughs> 
I didn't. I just wanted to get past there, and then then my son's bag came through, and he's like, "Oh, excuse me, sorry, you guys can't go. Uh, we've detected a sharp object in your son's backpack." And I'm like, "What do you mean? There's pillow and a blanket in there. There's nothing sharp in there." And they open it up, and they pull pull out a full on big old pair of scissors, and I'm I'm looking at my son. And I'm like, "Why did you pack that? This was not parent approved." And he was like, "I." I just wanted to do crafts on the plane. And I'm like, crafts? Since when have you ever done crafts? The one time you want to do crafts, you pack scissors on. Anyways, it was not off to a good start. We hadn't even gotten on the plane yet, and my piece was gone. Right? And and this is this is how we what we need to understand is that God has perfect peace for us when everything is anything but perfect. If our peace is based on everything going according to plan. You and I will never have peace. But that's not the peace that God offers us. This is what he offers us in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, not the world's peace, God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. It goes beyond our brain. It doesn't under, we, we, God's peace is able to be with us even when we don't understand what's going on. His peace will guard our heart and our minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I want you to understand this promise here. It's a conditional promise. He says, then you will experience God's peace. After what? After you tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. And so that would be the place right now, before we even get any more into the message. If you have been in a place of anxiety or panic or fear, tell God what you need. Thank him for what he's done already, even before that need is met. You see, what God wants to do is he wants to close the gap between panic and peace. And how does that happen? Through prayer. Paul tells us right off the bat. It's not going to be through you and I figuring things out, because a lot of times we still won't be able to. His peace passes all of our understanding. So you want to close that gap between peace and panic? Start with prayer. Tell him what you need. Thank him for what he's done. And understand this, that this ongoing conversation is going to teach us something about peace. That it's not fleeting like the world's peace. Everywhere we go, Jesus with us every day, we can actually walk in that peace. Because first of all, peace is a person, not a place. Peace is a person, not a place. This is really, really good news, whether we're talking about the White House or our house or anywhere in between. It's easy to be peaceful when you are in a peaceful place, like a park or watching a sunset or at the beach. But the moment that you get back into the car, right, or you head back into real life, what happens to that peace? It's fleeting. That's not the peace that God's giving us because that peace is a person. His name is Jesus, and he gives us a peace that cannot be taken from us. John 14, 25 through 27 describes it this way. Remember, he was talking to his disciples, and he was saying, it's better that I go so I can send the Holy Spirit to you. And they were like, how can this be better? And he says, all of this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. How much do we need that word right now? He's not giving us a peace like the world gives. You see, God's peace is relational. The world's peace is circumstantial, conditional, situational. Right? Everything has to be all lined up. But God's peace is in the middle of the storm. God's peace is regardless of circumstances. It's relational. And God's peace is inward. The world's peace is outward. The world only knows peace as long as everything is going well, which is why most of the people that you and I know right now have no peace because things have been so chaotic. God's peace protects us free and constantly. Right? The world's peace is fleeting and demands a high price. In a normal year, Americans will spend upwards of $475 billion on vacations, right? I gotta get out of this place. 
if it's the last thing I ever do, right? Everyone's willing to pay a high price just for a moment of peace and vacations are kind of a, a great way to contrast the world's peace with the Lord's peace because God's peace is with us wherever we go. Think about the last vacation. Maybe it, maybe it's been a while with COVID, but think about the last vacation you had, right? You you spend so much money just getting away. Most of the budget gets spent on that. You unpack and for a moment you're laying there in the chair, the sun on you with a drink in hand. And for just one minute, you finally have that peace, right? You're thinking, this is the life. And then one minute later, your young son walks up to you and goes, Hey, Dad, I found this. And he holds up to you a gold square foil package that he found floating in the hot tub. And he says, what is this for, Dad? I wish I was making that up. But that's exactly how fleeting peace can be. Because the moment that you have everything lined up is the moment the world is going to throw something at you from an angle you're not even seeing. But God's peace is free and it's constant because he's with us. If you only are looking for peace in a vacation, listen, I, we lived in Hawaii. We lived near Waikiki. I could tell you, people that had saved up their entire lives just to get there, peace was far from them. And if you and I can grab a hold of the fact that our peace comes not from a circumstance or a situation or a location, but it comes from the person of Jesus Christ, then that's what you and I are going to do. We're going to pursue that relationship with him. The closer we are to him, the more we're going to have that peace. And so our community builder discussion question here is where are three places you have no peace? And we can invite Jesus into that place through prayer. And I, I again, prayer is how Paul said we're going to have, tell Jesus what you need. Thank him for what he's done. Close that gap between panic and peace by starting to pray right now. If you're watching this at home, just push the pause button on this and think through three areas that you know there's anxiety, three areas that are keeping you up at night, right? Three areas that are making your resting face kind of a mean face, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Those are the areas that we want to bring back to the Lord. So the, the plane flight, you know, it was fine because I put in my my earbuds and the boys watched movies. We were finally landing in Seattle. It was around 10 o'clock at night. We went to Alamo to get our reservation. We had to reserve, of course, one of the the big vehicles for to fit our whole family. And we get there and there, there was a line. So we're waiting. It's 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock. Finally, they say, hey, uh, we just needed to let you know Burgesses. Yes, Burgesses. We just needed to let you know the vehicle you reserved, we gave to someone else. And I'm looking at them going, wait, wait, wait hold, on, hold on here. It's 11 o'clock at night. We've been traveling all day long. My kids are exhausted. And you're saying that we... We reserved the vehicle, but you gave it to someone. So what have we been waiting here for a vehicle that we didn't have? It's, I felt like I was living a Seinfeld episode, right? We made the reservation, but you didn't keep the reservation. So we did our part. It seems like the keeping is the most important part of the reservation process, right? And the guy's just like, yeah, I'm really sorry about that. So I'm like, Okay, what can he do for us? And he said, well, we can give you one of these large vans. And I'm like, perfect. Well, at this point, I'll take a bicycle. Uh, I, I was not being a very good witness at that time. I was super frustrated. My, my wife was like, hey, John, it's okay. We're, we're going to figure this out. I'm like, hey, give me the van. I've got bagels. I've got boys. I've got baggage. And I'm ready to go. Just give me the van. So we get everything loaded up into the van. The van. Two hours later after landing in Seattle and we're about to take off and the guy runs up to me he's like oh hold on hold on were you planning on taking this van out of state I said yes when I made the reservation we made it clear that we're going to be driving this vehicle from Washington to Oregon to California and they said oh sorry sorry we we can't let you take this vehicle out of state we have some rules about driving vehicles out of state in case 
you are bringing contraband into another state. And by this point, like, I, I'm, I'm about to flip my lid, right? I'm like, what is the deal? The pat down in the morning, right? Bomb residue with my bagels. And now you think I've got drugs in my van. Do I look like a terrorist? Do I look like a drug dealer? Anyways, my wife was like squeezing my arm, helping me to calm down and to enter a place of peace and this is where I have to ask you, this is why it's so important that you and I understand peace is a person and not a place because it's in these places where nothing is going according to plan that we have to ask ourselves, is peace puny or is it powerful? What are we leaving in our wake when we are leaving a situation? Are people happy to have us walk out of the room? Because the moment that we do, things calm down a little bit. Are, are they relieved when we walk away? We must understand that the world needs right now is not a peace sign. They need a sign of peace. And a lot of times, that's going to be you and I walking out the reality that the peace of Jesus is powerful in the face of chaotic circumstances. 2 Thessalonians 3, 16-18 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself, notice he even describes himself as peace. The Lord of peace himself continually grants you peace in some circumstances. No, every circumstance. When you're waiting at the Alamo and you think it's going to be your last stand. He wanted to grant me peace. I just wasn't accessing it. Jesus was right there with me, with the baggage, with the frustrations. I just wasn't seeking it from him. I wasn't inviting Jesus every day into that situation. But he says, I, he's going to grant you peace if you go after it. In every circumstance, the Lord be with you all. But you notice Paul is praying over the church in Thessalonica as he's writing out this letter. It's a written prayer. And he says, in fact, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. And this is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Why is he saying that? Well, sometimes in those days they didn't obviously have email or phones or anything. Some people would forge a letter from Paul. And so Paul is saying, hey, you can compare this letter to past letters that I've written to you. This is my handwriting. And he didn't want the church in Thessalonica to miss it. I don't want you to miss it either. That the God of peace, it, it, his whole character is to bring that peace to you into every circumstance. Paul wasn't offering something he could do. He was offering something only Jesus could do. This church was enabled to know that peace is in our trials. Peace is in our situations. It's powerful. It's not puny. It's not weak. A lot of us look at peace as some kind of a wimpy thing. And Jesus is not wimpy. He is powerful. And he's describing himself in this way. And Paul is praying this over the church and saying, you can receive this. Again, prayer is an uncommon solution to common problems that stress us out in our lives. It's an invitation for God's supernatural to invade our natural and change how we're responding to the situations around us. I mean, when it comes down to it, peace is the punctuation on a life of prayer. So what's the punctuation on your life look like when people are with you? Are you leaving more of a question mark or an exclamation point? Do you, are you questioning God? Or like Paul, are you able to say, I am leaving you a permanent signature driving home the point that my God is a God of peace in every single circumstance. This is not condemnation. It's an invitation to a life of constant conversation with God. It's really what our whole 40 days of prayer is about. When, when we're encouraging each other during the 40-day spiritual journey up to Easter, to ask this simple question. I wish I would have asked this at the Alamo <laughs> waiting for my rental car at midnight because it would have brought in God's peace, God's perspective into that place. It's, it's a powerful thing to ask this question. What is Jesus doing in this crisis? What is he doing in this stressful situation? And then he's able to give us his lenses to see how he's doing things in the middle of the unresolved. Let's resolve to enter his peace through prayer. So in, fact, in fact, we can do that right now. And our community builder discussion question is, who are three people I can pray the prayer a peace of Jesus over right now? You and I know three people at least. 
I learned this idea of of invitational prayer, conversational prayer from my parents. I, I remember it was it was a couple of years ago. My my dad had found out that he had prostate cancer, and he was going in to uh, surgery to have his prostate removed. And my mom sent me this picture. Look at that. I mean, what guy goes into <laughs> <laughs> surgery uh, for to remove prostate cancer and is smiling like that. I that's that's my dad. You know why? Because he was praying. He said, "I'm not going into this alone. I'm going into this surgery room, this operating room, with my Savior." And he had a perfect peace, even while going in to that surgery. And, and in fact, you're going to actually get to hear from my dad in next week's message on Sunday, fun day. He's going to be doing a fun cooking illustration. I can't wait for you to hear what God puts on his heart about patience. But I, I, I learned that from them. And now I'm applying this in, man, I, I needed this message this week. You guys, many of you know, at the Father's house, you know the Siervos. And I had uh, just received um, a text yesterday. That sweet little Karis right here, five-year-old in kindergarten. She had been run over by a car and it uh, broke her pelvis and, and crushed her femur. And she was rushed to the emergency at Radies Children's Hospital. And when I was there with this amazing family, uh, with Jordan and April, I was amazed at the peace that they had even in the middle of this horrendous circumstance. In fact, April was even saying, I've just been finding things to thank God for. It could have been a lot worse. It could have been more permanent damage. I was just amazed at how they were able to enter into that. And we were able to pray together, inviting God's powerful, not puny, his powerful peace into that place, into that crisis situation. I've been praying God's peace over my friend St. Nick and his family who also this week just found out that they have two types. He has two types of cancer. Uh, and I, I just believe that God is going to heal him. And, and St. Nick said, when I, when I talked to him, he said, I'm strong as an ox. Spiritually, I'm fantastic. Mentally, I'm just drained. And it's, uh, on top of finding out he has two types of cancer, he found out that his, his medical won't cover the procedures needed to attack that cancer. And so I was amazed at the fact that he had such a peace, even with all of these unknowns, all of these question marks, but he replaced them with an exclamation point going, I know that God is in control and we're just standing with him there. Now, who are the people that you're praying with? Don't panic. They need you and I to invite the power of God's peace into those circumstances right along with, with them. Because peace is not a place, it's a person. Peace is not puny, it's powerful. And finally, peace is purposeful, not passive. And that with the Siervos, with St. Nick and his family, with my parents, each of those situations, God is moving. And it just takes one person to be purposeful about accessing the presence of God in those situations. And that can be you and I. In fact, this is why God needs us to do this. Matthew 5, 1 through 2 and verse 9. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up on a mountain and he was seated. His disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them. And this, of course, is the beginning of the Beatitudes. When you and I look out at the masses and the multitudes of the people around us, what do we see? We see panic. We see anxiety. We see fear. We see shame. We see people trying to compensate for the lack of control, right? Because the only peace that the world knows is when circumstances can be controlled and you and I both know from this last year it showed us we're not actually in control at all there's only one who is and he says out of as he's looking at this group of people all in hurt and pain he says blessed are the peace makers notice, notice he doesn't say peace keepers he said blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God our identity as men and women of God flow from the fact that we are peacemakers. Now, a peacekeeper is someone who's just trying to keep, again, control the circumstances, don't rock the boat, keep everything nice, keep everything copacetic. But you and I both know in the reality of COVID, we need peacemakers. That's bringing something out of nothing. That's bringing peace into a situation of chaos. That's like God speaking into the null and void in Genesis 1 saying, let there be light. He needs you and I to be, let there be peacemakers. And there's a blessing that comes when you and I are purposeful about it. You know, 
A rabbi once said, unfortunately, in speaking of peace, when all is said and done, more is said than done. And so we're going to take some action at the Father's house to be peacemakers right where we wake, work, and worship, right in our own neighborhoods. As I mentioned, St. Nick, he's, he's my neighbor. You know neighbors, friends, and co-workers that are going through some pretty heavy stuff. And that's why March 14th, we are calling Stay at Home Sunday. I want to encourage you, don't go to church. I know it's weird for to have a pastor say that. On this Sunday, don't go to church, be the church. We're redeeming this. A year ago, uh, because of COVID, we were forced to stay out of the church. This year, we're choosing to be the church in our homes, inviting people to watch the 9 a.m. and have breakfast with you, inviting people to have the uh, watch the 11 a.m. and have, have lunch with you. But reach out to those. Be purposeful about who you're going to invite. People that would otherwise maybe not come to church or have stopped coming to church during COVID. People that feel isolated or alone. Listen, we have a really serious circumstance right now. We have a spike in, in suicides in our nation. Uh, in fact, CDC Director Robert Redfield, and this is back in July, said there's been a cost higher, especially with our young people, seeing sadly far greater suicides than even deaths from COVID, far greater deaths from drug overdoses. People are looking to escape the, the horror or the loneliness or the panic of where it is that they're at. The American Association of Suicidology, President Jonathan Singer, uses an analogy. Everyone's weathering the same storm in different boats. If evictions start to ramp up, we're going to see that people are in different boats in the same storms. Some of those boats are going to sink. And so they're saying that the in the wake of COVID, there could be higher suicide deaths than even those that are dying from COVID. What does this have to do with you and I? Well, I think that's exactly why you and I live where we live. We work where we work. We know who we know. There's some people who have isolated and insulated themselves that maybe you've lost contact with, and maybe that's who God wants you to invite. Again, peace is powerful, not puny. Peace is purposeful, not passive. I think about this bridge in the UK where I came across this story of this man who was standing on the edge and he was about to end his life by jumping off the bridge and one passerby grabs a hold of his belt and he's still so desperate to end his life that he's trying to pull away while well, another man puts his arm around him and he was still trying to pull away. Another man literally grabs some rope and ties himself to the guy on the bridge until the emergency workers could arrive. That is peace. That is purposeful. That is you and I so dedicated to making sure no one misses out on the Prince of Peace, knowing that Jesus can give them a reason for living. I think about Chin Tsai, the, who dedicates his life to preventing suicides in China's most notorious jumping spot. He saved 321 people in 13 years. At 197 feet above the water, it's a notorious suicide spot, but this man rents a two-bedroom flat near the bridge for those in need. This is amazing to me. He chooses to live right next to this bridge. I think you and I are living maybe not next to an actual bridge, but we're living with people, working with people, related to people that desperately need you to look out for them, to reach out for them. And then finally, Don Ritchie, an 84-year-old, lives across the street from the most famous suicide spot in Australia, a cliff known as The Gap. Most people would move, but Richie's stayed for almost 50 years, saving an estimated 160 people from suicide. He wakes up every morning, he looks out the window for anyone standing too close to the precipice, and if he sees someone over there, he just gently walks over there and begins to strike up a conversation. This blows me away. And his whole goal is to say, hey, would you like to come back with me? My house is right there. Come back to my house for a spot of tea. And he just acts in a friendly manner, bringing peace into that situation where people want to end their life. And so it's with that idea that I want us to ask ourselves, who are three people that I can invite to join me at Stay at Home Sunday on March 14th? Maybe you're thinking, well, I don't, I don't know anybody that's, that's suicidal. Well, most of the time we don't know until it's too late. I'm just asking you to pray. Just asking you to consider, and maybe it's not just inviting people over that are, are considering ending their life, but people that are, are have maybe just grown disconnected. 
maybe have a lot of anxiety in their life and they could just use someone that purposefully bringing peace into their life by inviting them over to your house to hear a word of hope, to enjoy a meal, to start a conversation that could lead to transformation. Most of all, inviting them into your home where you and I are going to contend to have the Prince of Peace residing, right? Starting here first and moving out from there. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for the opportunity to join with every person watching this right now. I feel like there might even be some who have considered whether they should even keep living, who have faced such dire circumstances and situations that they have believed the lie that no one would even notice if they were no longer here. I, I thank you, God, that they're watching right now. God, so that you can speak to them and remind them that you love them and that you've made them for a purpose. And I just pray, God, that your peace that passes understanding would guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus and that you would remind them how valuable they are. And even right now, God, as we are praying, Jesus, you are peace. We invite your peace into the circumstances that we're facing. Would you bring to mind people that we need to reach out to? Very purposefully invite to join us on Stay at Home Sunday. Invite out for coffee to just reconnect with and bring peace into that situation. And for every place where we ourselves, God, have anxiety or fear or worry, God, we just invite you into those places right now. God, we tell you what we need. We thank you for what you've done. And we receive your peace in this place. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. If you need prayer for anything, and I mean anything at all, just so simple. Just grab your phone and text prayer 760-334-5533. I and our prayer team would love to join in prayer agreement with you over anything. Can be big, can be small. Nothing is insignificant to our God because he loves you. And I'm so thankful that you spent time with us today. And I can't wait to see you next week as we talk about patience. So I guess I will wait. I'll see you then. Yeah.